Welcome to Chai with Ping. This is Ping Robert. In this podcast, I cover immigrant stories, cross-cultural experiences, and minority issues. Join me with a cup of chai and take a listen. And then, do I sound okay? Yeah, you yeah. sound great. Okay, cool. Then we can get started. Ready? Mm-hmm. Welcome back to Chai with Ping. My name is Ping. Thank you so much for coming back to the show. And if you haven't already, please do follow me on Instagram or Facebook, and also subscribe to the channel on whatever、um, app you're using, because then you can get new episode and updates whenever there is a new drop.、Um, and then I would love to hear your feedback or or reflection on the social media, so you can take a screenshot and then put on your、um, ideas or comments, and then tag me. My handles are Chai with Ping, and then. I'll be、uh, very, very happy to see your feedback, and I really hope to see you online. All right, so today we have two lovely girls、um, coming <laughs> to my show. The series is for Asian adoptees. I recently come to this topic, and I did some research and became very interested. I had the、um, opportunity to actually join the heritage camp in Colorado two, two, three years. I'm not sure. The pandemic definitely threw me off with the time, um, but um, it my attention to pay attention to the like the people who are adoptees, and I also had the um the privilege to teach one of them. And so today, after a deep search, that I finally get these two sisters to come on my show, and then we are also gonna hear their stories later. So let's welcome Sarah and Emily Quinn. Thank you. So glad to be here. Yeah. All right. So, so I don't think anyone can see you guys. So, why don't you have a little introduction, and then we can get familiarized with your sound. Sounds good. So, my name is Sarah Quinn. I am 29 years old, Chinese adoptee,、um, from Colorado. Been here my whole life, minus the four months while I was in China.、Um, I'm a rock climber. I'm a project manager now. Um, as Ping mentioned, the heritage camps. I am an alum from the camps and a counselor coordinator and former counselor as well. So very involved with the camps throughout the years. And I'm Emily Quinn. I am 27 years old.、Um, I also grew up in Colorado, minus the three months that I spent in China. And、um, similar to my sister, I also grew up going to heritage camps for adoptive families. And I'm still involved with them、um, as a high school coordinator, and I've been a counselor for them as well,、um, and and am a camp alumni. And then I also have been involved with Adopt Teen,、um, which is another post adoption service、um, and resource for adoptees, and they mostly deal with tweens and teens. So I've been involved with them for a little bit as well. Awesome! Thank you so much for、um, providing all that resources. We can talk about the heritage camp and adopting organization a little bit later at the end. So both of you were adopted from China, correct? Yeah, but you guys are not biologically related. Correct. Yep. I, Sarah, am t- two years older than Emily, so I was adopted in '92, and Emily came home in '94.、Um, close provinces, but different provinces. Got it. Wow. So, what is the the background of this whole adoption process for you guys? <laughs> <laughs> Someone pick it up. <laughs>、um, yeah. So, our parents,、um, as Sarah said, adopted us two years apart.、Um, Sarah's from Jiangsu Province. I'm from Zhejiang Province.、Um, so, both kind of southern China,、um, and both of us were. Adopted during the one child policy, and we we're both also adopted during the early wave of when China opened its doors for international adoption as well. So,、mm. yeah, I believe actually in '92 I was among one of the first groups to actually、um, be adopted from China,、um, and so my adoption group was very small. There were just three of us in total. I know as the agency has kind of opened up more adoptions, and the country opened up more. Adoption, the adoption groups got a lot larger, so it really just shows that we were definitely early on in this in the process. Yeah, similarly,、um, my group was seven families, so a little bit larger, but still pretty small.、Um, and I think Sarah was like the second Chinese adoptee in the state,、um, so it was a pretty big deal back then. Wow, I didn't know that. So、yep. you guys are almost like. 
the celebrities among <laughs> adopties. <laughs> so tell me a little bit. Um, are there other kids in the family? So I actually don't know anything about my birth family. Um, that is something I'm actually really curious about is figuring out if I had any biological siblings because um, the other two in my adoption group were not biologically related. Um, but as far as I know, no, we don't really know for sure. Um, I have done like a 23andMe test and found some like relative, like close relatives or I guess distant relatives, but nothing has indicated I've had, I have a biological sibling at this point. Yeah, similarly, um, also did a 23andMe and have the closest relative is like third cousin um, and like maybe 1% shared DNA. Um, I also am super curious about my biological family though um, and have kind of started the process of searching, but um, not seriously um, in part because COVID hit. And so it kind of tampered down any uh, progress that I had made, um, but I had inquired about the process. And so um, if I can ever get the opportunity to do that, I'll know kind of the steps that I can go through to find any biological family. Um, in terms of our adoptive family, no other siblings in our family, um, many cousins, but no other siblings, just the two of us. Mm -hmm. Did you ever ask your parents why they choose to adopt kids from overseas? Yeah, we have. Um, one of the big reasons was they were unable to have biological children on their own. Mm -hmm. um, and my mom had always said, or our mom had always said growing up that she always pictured herself being a mom, but never really being like pregnant, um, which is very uh, serendipitous, I feel. Um, and they had tried prior from other countries and um, just different things happened where they either got denied or the country closed down for adoptions. Um, and then when China opened up, it kind of was full speed ahead and they were able to get it pretty quickly at that time. Cool. Did you ever ask your parents where you guys came from or how come? I assume they look different. <laughs> yes. 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 Both, of, both of our parents are white. And so okay. our family definitely looks different than um, a lot of other ones we grew up with. Um, I don't ever remember having the conversation of, of having to ask our parents where we came from. For us, it seems like adoption has just always been something we've known. And our parents have done a really good job of making sure um, we knew that we were adopted, like we knew why we were adopted, um, like where we came from. And our parents even really did, did a really good job of incorporate, helping us incorporate both into the American culture where we lived and also the Chinese culture. So um, we did Chinese school for several years. Um, I did Chinese folk dance. Emily did Kung Fu. Like I said, we attended the heritage camps. And so to me, I don't think there was ever a period where we didn't know our background and where we came from, which I feel very fortunate for now because I've heard other people that haven't had that experience and parents kind of don't really want to talk about that with their kids. It's always been a very open topic for our household. Yeah, kind of going off of that, um, like we definitely never really had like a year adopted conversation. It was definitely more of um, incorporating it into our daily lives. Um, apparently when we we're really young, before we could even remember, our parents would play you know, music tapes and different things that had um, the word adoption in it and different like cultural aspects or talking about China. Um, and then I think kind of, you know, going off of what Sarah said too, going to heritage camps at such a young age and going to Chinese school and all of that really helped connect us with our Chinese culture. So it was never really a question. Um, like I started going to heritage camps when I was three, Sarah was like five. So very young. Um, and so, what? yeah, <laughs> I didn't know they have uh, attendees for that young. I know yeah, so, like for teenagers, for sure, for three years old. Yeah. So actually our mom was one of the co-founders of Chinese Heritage Camp. So she oh, really helped okay. bring that camp to life. So um, that's just really how devoted she was to making sure that was a part of our story. And yeah, very fortunate for that. Yeah. And she also helped to um, create the Colorado Dragon Boat Festival. Mm -hmm, she was mm -hmm. on the original operating committee. So she was very committed to keeping our culture and having racial mirrors part of our lives so that we never felt too isolated. 
wow, I didn't know that festival was founded by your family. That is just, <laughs> maybe I should get your mom to the show. <laughs> yeah, yeah, we'll yeah. talk about that after we, we record. Yeah, this yeah. is so cool. I, so, well, I have to be upfront. I really don't know who you guys were when Daphne introduced uh, you guys to me. And then I'm just like, oh, sure. I can interview strangers, but I never imagined. Because I think I remember the lady who was talking about starting the camps and all that at the end of the heritage camp, which I joined probably 2018. Well, wow, such a long time ago. How about share a little memories with us? What did you remember while you grew up here? So I remember something that we always did as a family was we would always go to San Francisco for Chinese New Year. Um, I, I mean, the Denver's Asian community is definitely growing now, but I would say when we were younger, it was pretty small, um, definitely compared to San Francisco and other parts of the country. And so our family, our vacation every year was to San Francisco for the Lunar New Year Festival, which was great. I always remember doing that. Yeah. Um... I think we stopped doing that when we were pretty young. I think around the year of the dragon, um, because I distinctly remember going there for Chinese New Year and getting stuffed dragons to bring <laughs> home. Um, and then I think, you know, maybe like the Asian community kind of around here started growing. And then we started um, replacing that trip with going to dim sum here in Denver every year for the Lunar New Year and, um, you know, watching Shaolin Hong Mei with their lion and dragon dances. Um, and so I remember that. And then I, I also just distinctly remember going to camp, honestly, as well. Um, it's definitely where I feel like we bonded, especially when we were older because we were in the same group, but also where we were able to bond with other adoptees and other families who look like ours. Um, and some of our really good friends, some of both of us have like really good friends and possibly like some of our closest friends are from that camp as well. So, mm -hmm. yeah, I mean, our, our mom, like you said, was the director of tiny camp for several years. And then our dad was a truck driver for several years. So it truly was a family affair and just something we looked forward to every single year. I remember one year my mom was late registering us. And so <laughs> we actually like got waitlisted for camp. And I was like bawling my eyes out because like camp was such an important part of our life. And it was something I just knew every single Labor Day, we'd be going up to Snow Mountain Ranch for camp. And so my mom, I think she should take Emily to the doctor. So she was missed the registration and it was so popular. It waitlisted. And so as you remember crying to my mom about how the year was going to be ruined and it was like the worst thing ever. And um, of course, of course, Pam was like, you guys are always welcome to come to camp. You're never going to be waitlisted. So that made me feel better, but that just really, it just really shows how much, how important heritage camp was to us. Yeah. yeah. And then you basically grew up in a camp. So it's almost like a huge family for you guys. Exactly. Yeah, for sure. I, I definitely consider it kind of like a home away from home. And mm. I remember like after my first or second year in college, I was helping out with the Chinese Heritage Camp um, 2, which is in Denver. And I remember I was coordinating for elementary school at that point. But then I had to step down because I wasn't able to make it back to camp because I had summer school for my major. Um, and I remember like talking at the parent meeting and starting to cry because it meant so much to me that I couldn't like come back to help more people too. Um, and I think like, you know, just growing up and being part of like the Asian community here is just a distinct memory. Also, like another big thing I remember is when we would go to the Colorado Dragon Boat Festival. And there's two memories I have from that. One, when we did like the official like ribbon cutting together um, to open up the festival. And then another, when we were working the Pepsi booth actually um, with some other people who were volunteers, but who knew our family pretty well. And just getting to spend that time with kind of like older aunties and uncles um, from the Asian community was really rewarding. I feel like these are the parts where your family kind of thrive and become successful of supporting you guys. Have you ever felt out of place in your other communities because of your racial identity or how you look? Yeah, I think in both 
American school and Chinese school, we both fell slightly out of place. I mean, I know in like regular school, we were one of the only Asians at the school. And so we definitely looked different than most people. Um, and even where our parents still live, it's a very white um, area. And so there's not a lot of Asians there. Um, it wasn't even really until college when I started to um, actually meet other Asians and, and really be friends with people in the Asian community out, outside of Heritage Camp. Um, like college is really where I saw other Asian students who were my age. Um, but I think even at Chinese school, there weren't very many adoptees there. And so majority of the people were Asian kids with Asian parents. And so I think we felt a little at a place there as well. But again, I mean, our mom even signed up to take classes with us. And so another thing she did really well was try to just to try to help us get acclimated with the culture was she enrolled herself in Chinese classes. So I think that was really helpful also. Yeah, I think that, um, like Sarah said, like there's definitely been moments in both communities I felt kind of like in this somewhere between gray space. Um, and, you know, growing up, we both were competitive gymnasts and we kind of just like our regular school, like there weren't really any other Asians on our team. And I remember um, I feel like I was felt like I was pretty out of place in that community. Um, and um, growing up to like going to schools that were predominantly white, I had other friends who were Asian, but not very many. Um, and in elementary school, I actually sought out another in first day of kindergarten, I sought out another Asian girl. I kid you not. And we became best friends. And I actually found out later, um, very soon, but found out like, you know, a couple hours in or whatever, that she was also a Chinese adoptee. So I think that's part of why we became best friends so young. Um, but then I think kind of similarly, like not until I went to college, was I really, did I really pick and was I able to pick and choose other people who are from Asian cultures and surround yourself with them um, and really get to know kind of more of like their traditions growing up versus like the perspective for us being an adoptee. Have any people say any hurtful things to you guys? Honestly, I didn't get a lot of discrimination growing up, um, which is great and very fortunate for that. I do remember one distinct moment in gymnastics. A girl came up to me and said, you have a flat face, flat face, flat face, and kind of ran away. And so I remember just going up to my mom and crying and being like, why did you say that? And um, obviously that got addressed by the coach really quickly and, and got shut down. Um, but that's really the only thing I, I can vividly remember growing up. Yeah, I don't really vividly like remember much about um, that, but I think that I definitely experienced different forms of racism and different microaggressions, but because it took a while to really understand what those were um, and then not really learning too much about race growing up, I think it's hard to kind of pinpoint like a distinct time. Um, I think, like I said earlier, like in gymnastics, I always felt pretty out of place and um, I remember one time that my team went on this like camping trip and then they didn't invite me, but then they talked about it during practice. And this was around high school age. So I was old enough to like, get it a little more. And I remember thinking in my head, like, I wonder if it's because I was Chinese um, and that I wasn't invited or different things like that. Um, and I also remember like, just like random comments from different kids growing up, like, oh, well, who are your real parents or um, different things? And then like when we're, I remember my mom telling us a story, like when we we're at a playground by our house and my dad was with us and like playing with us and stuff. And apparently he had gotten a comment of like, oh, how much did they cost? Wow. That is so rude. So I feel like maybe your parents also went through a lot of racist comments throughout the whole whole journey. Yeah. And I think, um, I think especially in the earlier stages, that was probably a lot more common than it is like now. Um, actually I do remember when we were in 
San Francisco one of the years. Someone, the store, we went into a store. We were with another fam adoptive family, um, just kind of checking out one of the shops in Chinatown. And the shop owner looked at my parents and asked, oh, how much did they cost? And I remember um, our mom kind of shuffling us out of the store really quick. And she never really, dis we never really discussed that. Um, but as you remember, it was like, it very, really upset my mom. So I didn't really bring it up again, but I just remember, I remember that when we were growing up. Thank you for sharing and being honest with us. This is very personal. And I'm also curious about how has being an Asian or Chinese adoptee here in, in the U.S. shaped your perspective in life? I think it's, I'm very fortunate for my experience. I've had a very, I feel fortunate to have been adopted. I, I know a lot of adoptees have a lot of negativity and um, like anger towards it. I don't really, personally, I don't have any anger or resentment towards it. I, I'm very proud of my story and my background and fortunate to have the parents I do. Um, I do think it's given us a definitely a different perspective. Like I think, so right now at my work, I'm involved in the Asian and Allied Professional Employee Resource Group. And my company is great at celebrating diversity across all sectors. Um, so that's unfortunate for that. But I think from that, I've learned a lot about like Asian values. And I think because we grew up with white parents, some of those values weren't really practiced by us because we really more followed the and practice the traditional American values that people are used to. And so the Asian values are a little different. Um, I think also really just growing up with the last name Quinn, it's definitely not Asian. And so I think a lot of times when, like when you're applying for a job or talking to someone on the phone, they're definitely not expecting you to look like you, like me to look like I actually look. And so when I used to do a lot of um, visits with customers, I always kind of got hesitant about it because the person that they interact with every day, probably not, they're not expecting me to walk through the door. And I mean, some people, you know, are not tolerant and really not accepting of others. And so um, it kind of left a little bit of anxiety for me on that sense. But um, in general, I I feel like I had to bring a lot of different perspectives and in a unique background to, to my work and just my life. Yeah, I think for me too, it's kind of just been able to give me a very unique perspective and see the world through such a different and um, kind of unique lens as well. Um, I feel like similarly, like I feel super fortunate to have the family I do from parents to grandparents to aunts and uncles to sister. Um, like we're like pre we're best friends. So in that sense, like I wouldn't have it any other way for sure. Um I think it's interesting because in some regards, it makes me think about like, well, my life could have been completely different depending on who I was adopted by. Um, for example, in my adoption group, there's somebody who was raised in Texas and actually um, there was actually a boy in my adoption group, which at that time was super, super rare. And I remember my mom saying that they were so excited to have a boy that since they were like a repeat family for our adoption agency, they actually got the first call asking if they would want a boy. And my mom was like, oh, I don't really care. But my dad was like, no, I do not. Um, I want another girl because I want that sister bond. And so it's so interesting for me to think about, like, if he hadn't said that, like, would I have been the one growing up in Texas? Um, and just thinking about, like, the different life I could have had. Um, and then kind of like Sarah, too, I think that has really impacted like what I do and how I want to serve my community and how I impact people at work and in my profession. So I'm actually a physical therapist. Um, I forgot to mention that at the beginning. And I'm part of a diversity, equity and inclusion committee um, for like our national association. And even just recently, we and within our own committee took a survey to kind of get more of like our demographics and everything. And there's this one question and I didn't know how to answer it because it talks about what generation are you? And um, it was the answer kind of like, you know, parents weren't born here. My parents are the first to immigrate here and none of those applied. Um, and so that was something that most people don't really think of. Um, but for me, I, I brought it up and I was like, 
I had a hard time answering this question. I don't know if I even answered it because I didn't have my like, answer that I identified with there. Um, and so that just brings into like that whole unique experience, just like another perspective as well. And another layer of identity that I think is a huge part of my identity that other people don't necessarily have to deal with. Yeah, thank you so much for sharing that because I think we are more than just a checkbox. And a lot of issues are, are, are just behind all those questions and how they frame the questions as well. And so that's also why I want to in- invite you guys to talk about your experience because I don't really think we talk about it enough to understand it. So thank you so much for sharing that. Have you, tr- so you already mentioned that you went to Chinese school, you learned different things and, and you had that Dragon Ball Festival or Lunar New Year experience. Um, have you tried to search your cultural roots back to China? Because you talk about 23andMe, so that's the DNA test. Can you share a little bit of story around that part? So we did a homeland tour, our family. I think that was in 2011, 2006? No, it was two thousand. Five because I was 11. Oh, okay. So it was a while ago. Uh, and we visited both. We did like some of the touristy places, of course, but then we visited both my province and Emily's province. And so actually uh, I, they don't really don't know anything about my adoption. Um, I think I was found in the field and, and that was it. Um, I, and I grew up at the orphanage and I had a foster mom who for a while we were actually keeping in touch with every year, send notes, send gifts. Um, and so in that homeland tour, we got to go, we actually like met up with my foster mom. And so, I mean, at the age of 13, it wasn't super, um, fulfill, uh, fulfilling is not really the right word, but like, I wasn't super, it wasn't super impactful to me. I'd say, I think I was a little too young. And so I think had we done that maybe at a later age, it probably would have meant a little more. Um, but I, it was great to meet her and. Um, put that face. But again, it was, it was kind of young, so it, it didn't really have much of an impact um, to me at the time. Um, but then I remember we went to my orphanage and it had actually been transformed into mostly a special needs orphanage. But that was I, I remember loving that. We got to hold the babies and it was just really cool to kind of see that um, environment. It, it was kind of sad and kind of eye-opening to see that, like that was what our, our prior life was. Um, but it was great to, to get to go there and actually hold the babies, I remember. I think it's super interesting that she actually says it wasn't super impactful for her at the age of 13, because at the age of 11, there's definitely gaps in my memory, uh, without a doubt. But I feel like it was actually super impactful for me. Um, I So going to like my homeland and my home um, like province, Um, my orphanage, my original orphanage was torn down. And so luckily it was just recently torn down. So it's interesting because we went and saw the ruins from that. And then we went and saw the new orphanage that was built and like met up with the orphanage directors from what was present day. And then like the past orphanage directors, including the ones who, um, like cared for us. Um, and so I thought that was super interesting. And then, um, kind of, going off of what she said about holding the babies, I remember at my orphanage in particular, um, I got to hold a little baby who was around one years old. And um, I remember all of the, um, the like aunties, the caregivers were saying to all the little kids, like, look, it's your Jia Jia, it's your Jia Jia. And um, I thought that was like, that still is like definitely one of the memories I hold really close to my heart. Um, And I, every now and then like wonder like what happened to that little girl um and then I think it's also interesting too because I was found at a bus station and so we also visited that so I kind of got to see like where it's found and um but when I was found I actually which is super rare I had a note attached to me that had my birth date and the time I was born on it um and so I think honestly, knowing part of that information has almost made me more curious about finding my my biological family, because I always think in my head, like, if they cared enough to take that risk to put that information with me um, to have my whole life, then 
they really want me to have a better life and really love me. Um, and so I've always been, I think, a little bit curious about that as a result, um, for sure. Yeah, I think both of you mentioned that how you were found、um, and then transferred to the orphanage. I think Emily already touched upon that. It's like you wonder how it was like that that your birth mom or birth family could be going through at that moment. And Sarah, you said that you you didn't know, like if you're you're a, like at any point there will be a biological family. Do you guys always wonder, or are you kind of you past that stage? For me personally, I've never been curious about my biological parents.、Mm -hmm. um, I don't know why. I just have never really had a desire to find them.、Um, the only thing I really want to know about my background is that I'm curious about, and I do wonder about a lot, is if I had any biological siblings. Specifically, I think a twin would be really <laughs> cool. That's like、um, big thing in there. But I've always been kind of curious about that. But. Um, I did 23 and Me really just to figure out if like my what my true ethnicity was. So I did a study abroad program in college, and it was in sh Shanghai.、Um, and everybody I met there asked me if I was Korean, and so I always kind of wondered like maybe I am. And so that first time I did 23 and Me, it did say I was part Korean, which I was very pleased about. Just kind of, just kind of like knowing, oh wow, maybe people were right. It was only like two percent, but I was like, hey, there is some in there.、Mm -hmm. Um, but lately, but then they kind of did an update and said it's a hundred percent Chinese. So, so we'll see. But that's really why I wanted to. Do, that's what kind of spurred me to do Twenty Three and Me was just to kind of see my my ethnicity. Yeah, for me, I think part of it was to see my ethnicity, which has pretty much been like a hundred percent Chinese、um, all along.、Um, so even with all the updates and stuff. But I think I've always been a little bit more curious than Sarah has about biological family in terms of biological parents.、Um, I think we're both very curious about siblings. I I think that's almost like one of the adoptee things is like always being curious if you if you have siblings, especially a twin,、um, and just like is there another one of me out there type of thing.、Um, but I've definitely as I've gotten older, it comes in waves. I think of it kind of like a roller coaster sometimes.、Um, Of wanting to search and then not wanting to search, and、um, I think with COVID this last year, it's almost heightened it again,、um, and maybe more curious because,、uh, especially with all the deaths that occurred around the world and how hard China was hit originally, I definitely have had thoughts within this last year of, I wonder, is it too late?、Um, are Any of my biological family even still alive?、Um, is it a hopeless thing to think about and wonder about?、Um, and it's almost made me think about like, as our our adopted parents do get older, like, well, maybe I should start looking sooner rather than later. You just never know. Life is so short.、Um, but there's it, it is a process,、um, and with my work, it's kind of hard to. Do some of those steps, like take three weeks off in a row to be able to go to China.、Um, but I, I've definitely always been very curious, and I also did a short study abroad program.、Um, mine was only two weeks, and I did it in Beijing and Chengdu,、um, and we learned about traditional Chinese medicine. And so I thought that was interesting too, because whenever. Um, any of the people at the schools,、um, including some of the students that we got to know, like they found out I was like a Chinese adoptee. They were like, "Whoa, like she's one of us and stuff." So that was pretty cool.、Um, but then it was also interesting because, like, when I would go to like bargain and stuff, like my Chinese is not very good. I quit Chinese school, <laughs> quite honestly.、Um, I did not like it. I always say I was a rebellious child who quit Chinese school, and so I quit when I was like nine. Like. I kid you not, like literally kicking and screaming, and my mom was like, "Okay, I'm gonna let you quit, but I'm telling, I'm letting you quit because you are old enough to understand that you're gonna regret this later." Fast forward a few years, I did, so I went back for a year. But it happened to be her last year there, and our Chinese school was like an hour away from my house. So my mom was like, "I have been driving a two-hour round trip every Sunday for 14 years." I'm done, and I couldn't have blamed her for that. Like she, it was not her fault that I quit. And so I 
kind of had to stop going to the language classes. I continued going for like Chinese school orchestra and different things, but the actual language part I wasn't able to do, took it up again in college, but still even taking it up again. Um, and when I went to China, I hadn't quite taken it yet in college. So my Mandarin was not very good, but what little I knew apparently got me by because I would try to bargain and then people would start talking to me like I was fluent. Thank goodness for <laughs> gestures because I was able to get the gist of it, but um, I did not know most of it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's like once you put a little Mandarin out, oh, that's so well. <laughs> and then they start and then you're like, uh, probably not that well. <laughs> <laughs> How would you say learning Mandarin language uh, is important for you or not? I think for me, it's gotten more important as I've gotten older. <laughs> like yeah. I said, I hated it when I was younger. Mm -hmm. um, but I do think that like I would love to learn it again and learn more of it because it's definitely one of those skills like you use it or lose it. And I would love to be able to um, like converse more in like what was supposed to be my native tongue um, as well. And I mean, honestly, too, like just thinking about like, the future and stuff like I I've always I'm not in any relationship right now but I've always like kind of seen myself with like another like Asian American possibly wait like down the road or whatever and if they are not another adoptee I think it'd be hard get if they were Chinese I should say and not an adoptee I think it'd be hard potentially to interact and to communicate with like family on that side um if I don't know it yeah, growing up, I always wanted to, like, my dream job actually um, was to be an interpreter. I thought that would be such a cool job. And so I think knowing Mandarin obviously would have been cru crucial for that. Um, I, I did go through Chinese school. I graduated. Um, and then, like, my Chinese dance teacher like, spoke to me in mostly Mandarin. And when uh, even, and I took more Chinese classes in college as well. And so my Chinese was actually pretty good. Uh, when I was in Shanghai for the month program I did, I got like, almost fluent, really good at my Chinese. Um, unfortunately, now, though, there's not really an opportunity for me to speak it. I don't do dance anymore. Um, and I don't have, I mean, I do have Chinese speaking friends, but we primarily converse in English. So I can understand a little bit better than I can actually speak. I can read it pretty well. Um, but can't write it super well. So it is a skill I'd like to get better at. Um, glad I had it, like the opportunities I did because it really helped me when I studied abroad. Um, it, that was great. Um, unfortunately, I'm just unfortunate I don't have much of an opportunity to use it now. I do think though, like the small amount that both of us know, it. I think it kind of still ties us down to like our cultural roots. Like even just something as little as like being able to write out like I love you in a text or like Jia Jia and Mei Mei on our birthday cards. Like I think that's something that like we still kind of hold to. Um, but yeah, I definitely wish I had more of the language skill. And I think it's definitely something like like any language, you usually understand a little bit more than you can speak. Um, but even that for me is very limited. It's interesting how we put relationships between a language and a culture. A lot of us or a lot of people kind of judge us how much we can speak a language to relate to a certain culture. And I, I wonder if it's just because of your own expectation or there will be um, expectation coming from other people. Do other people expect you to speak Mandarin? In, in China. <laughs> I, yeah, in China, definitely, right? In China, I felt yeah. like they did because they were like, well, you look Chinese. Why don't you speak Chinese? <laughs> so yeah. I thought that's there. Um, yeah. I mean, here, I mean, most of the people like, I interacted with knew that we were adopted, so they knew our yeah. mom very well. So they uh -huh. like, knew that it was limited, but they always wanted to help us. And even Daphne said that she could start only speaking to me in Chinese. And I was like, no, please don't do that. <laughs> don't do that. Um, so, I mean, I, a lot of people here know our background and kind of know our family. And so I, I wouldn't say here, they necessarily think that they, that we should, I, I'd say most it's like the outside looking in that expects us to. Um, and that's kind of where you get like the microaggressions and, and the comments about like, well, 
why don't you speak? Like your English is so good or why don't you speak Chinese or tell me something in Chinese? And I think that's, that's more where we see it than people we know. Yeah, I would agree with that. I think it's definitely more of like the societal, like what they would expect to be norms, quote unquote, or just like if you meet, interact with like strangers who don't really know our family and our stories um, and just look at our race and our ethnicity and um, make assumptions. Um, And yeah, I think that it's interesting too, because I think it depends on context a lot too. Like I think in China, the first time that we went with our parents, they didn't expect us to speak Chinese. Like even in the airport, I really, I think you remember this too, but we were in the bathroom and these girls were like talking and they were like um, saying basically that it was like Megua, Megua shoes. Like they, and they knew we were from America because we were wearing Crocs. And so, <laughs> um, so that, like, I don't think anyone ever expected us to speak really Chinese there because we were with people who were white and we we're very, very Americanized <laughs> and stuck out like a sore thumb, even though we look Chinese. <laughs> awesome. Cool. Have you ever talked to your parents about finding your roots? I have um, more my mom, my dad, Mm -hmm. my mom, our mom tends to be a little bit more of the pragmatic, a little bit more emotional. Our dad's a little bit more (laughs) daddy, dad, like (laughs) dad, like, yep. (laughs) Um, Yeah. And doesn't really talk about feelings and anything, um, but I specifically have with my mom, especially when I first was thinking about searching for my biological family. Um, she was super supportive about it. Um, and I don't even know if my dad knows to this day, quite honestly, <laughs> but <laughs> my mom was like very supportive about it. And I think like she, she said something like, yes, yeah, so if you ever decide to go down this journey and or whatever, like I would totally be a part of it. I would love to go to China with you and do that whole thing with you too. So um, I think that's been super, super awesome. Yeah. I mean, I'm more like my dad. <laughs> Not super emotional. And, Tuck um, it in, right? Yeah. So, um, I, like I, said, I haven't really had a desire to find my birth family. And so I never, like my mom is aware of that, but I haven't really had to go any farther than that. <laughs> Cool. Awesome. So we already mentioned some of the resources and I would like to, you know, circle back to that. You talked about heritage camps, which is, I think, one of the biggest in the U.S. And they were offered for how many countries? There were many. I was shocked. Yeah. So, so China now, is the, yeah, definitely one. And they have like nine camps now. So yeah. they have Korean heritage camp, Indian Nepalese heritage camp, Latin American heritage camp. Um, RICA, which stands for Russian East Eastern European, European and Central, Central Asia. Uh-huh. Um, and then they have a domestic carriage camp. They have a they call CPI, so Southeast Asian Pacific Islander camp, and then the two Chinese camps. And African Caribbean. And African Caribbean camp. Yeah. Okay. Wow. And then what do you guys usually do in those camps? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I'm asking a, an obvious question because I know, but the audience don't know. Yeah. So, I mean, as campers, they have like workshops related to both your culture and also adoption. Um, and then you just like a lot of bonding activities as well. And obviously they progress kind of as you get older. Um, and so you can start camp as young as three and go up until you graduate from high school. And so, yeah, I mean, like Emily mentioned earlier, lifelong friends, like one of my best friends is from um, Chinese Heritage Camp, and we keep in touch almost daily still. Um, so thankful for that. I mean, as I ca- and also I think what's important about that is in addition to connecting with people whose families look like yours, you really get great counselors and they're truly your role models. I mean, especially for us when we were young growing up, there really weren't a lot of Asians in the media and really a lot of Asians that we could like like Asian adults that we would use as role models. And these counselors spend their time for these two day camp, two or three day camps to, to spend time with you and get to know you. And so it's really cool to see um, people that look like you in the leadership positions and to someone as there as a resource for you. So I would say that's another big, big perk of heritage camp. Um, Like that's how I met Daphne and some of my other great friends, lifelong friends 
I consider my my lifelong role models as well. And I met them through um, them being my counselors at heritage camps. Yeah. And the other thing I think that's super nice is that it's actually a family camp. So there's a lot of other post adoption resources out there, including adopting, which I mentioned, but um, it's not family oriented. And so Heritage Camps for Adopted Families is a family camp. So the kids go off in their own grade levels during the day. The adults go off and do their own workshops during the day. And then there's family time. Like you come together at lunch, you come together at dinner. Um, and so you can kind of discuss your days, which is really cool. And then there's like group events at night for like the whole camp where everyone can, you can hang with your friends, you can hang with your parents, like different things. And it's just a really great way for everybody to kind of reconnect um, from their days. And yeah, like Sarah said, like, I think some of the biggest benefits for us, especially growing up when we did in the 90s, where in the early 2000s, when there weren't very many Asian American role models, um, it really gave us those racial mirrors. And it really allowed us to see people who looked like us and make us feel less, like, less abnormal um, as well. And I think, too, like, that's where we got to learn a lot about, like, the different traditions and a little bit. And I really think it helped shape us a lot and really helped uh, acclimate us to being adoptees um, and kind of like have that identity and that strong foundation going into college, which um, for other adoptees that I know who didn't have this experience and this privilege of being able to go to camp every year or knowing about it, they definitely struggled when they reached college. And um, I don't really think either of us struggled too much when we went to college with our identities because of camps. Um, And they also inspired me personally to like create different communities on my own campus for adoptees as well. Um, But yeah, the camps are like a three to four day camp, family camp and great counselors and great workshops. So I love it. I feel like all those families need to walk for an extra mile to support their adopted kids and that's just so touching for me because it's like the whole family show up even siblings could be there as well Mm -hmm. and and that's just how much effort a family would put because some people will drive from across different states and that's like (laughs) not really cheap and all that but seeing those families willing to do that willing to support um their kids is just it's it's, it's emotional. <laughs> um, um, we talked about heritage camps and then Emily, you mentioned adopting. Is that another organization? It is. So that is, it was founded, I think, in 2007. And it's um, ironically also mostly Colorado based, but they have chapters around the country. Um, but a lot of those are currently on hold just because of COVID and everything that happened. They also, I know, do some summer camps, um, but there's, like I said earlier, their programming is really geared more towards tweens and teens. Um, as the adoptee population gets older, both heritage camps and adoptee are trying to, I think, implement a few different programs and workshops for adult adoptees as well. Um, but yeah, adopting, I did, I started volunteering there as a chapter coordinator when I lived in Phoenix, Arizona for a couple of years. Um, and now I just kind of help out whenever they need me to for some ver- different virtual events. Um, but similarly to heritage camps, I really like that it just it serves to connect adoptees to each other um, is the main thing and build that community. My last question is, what would you say to encourage the younger Asian adoptees in the U.S.? I think that's a tough question because I feel like there's a lot more than you can say in one or two sentences. Um, I think for me, I would say the biggest thing is to know that you're not alone um, and know that there is a decent sized population of Asian adoptees in the U.S. um, specifically. And there are resources out there, um, but it's just a matter of reaching out or finding them or possibly talking to your parents to help find some of these resources as well. Um, But I would also say too, that even if you're not super interested at a certain age, at some point it may become important for you to embrace your cultural identity. 
Um, and I think that the more you can, the more you're willing to be open to the idea, um, the better it will serve you in the future, especially when you like go off to college and you're on your own and have to try to explain your story to other people who really might not understand it. Yeah, I'd say that's a good one. I, and I know both of us growing up, you know, a lot of people that as kids really wanted to know nothing about their Chinese or, or their cultural background. They lived in America. They all only wanted to know about about that and forget about the rest. But and then they we saw that they grew up and went to college and then really they had all the questions then. And and that's fine. People, everyone's journey is different. But as Emily said, I think really being open to that. The other thing I'd add is really, I think it's parents should just really do a good job of equipping their kids with resources because I mean kids only know what they know. They don't really know anything out there. So if their parents are not talking about it with them, um, I think that's a, 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 sad, a loss for the kids to really get to know that whole side of them. And they don't even really know what to ask if their parents aren't talking about it. And so I um, highly encourage parents to to be open to it. And, and if the kids don't want to talk about it at that time, fine, um, respect that and just let them know that they're there to talk about it. But I don't think we've seen both sides or parents are very supportive like ours and also sides or parents pretend their kids not adopt it and hope that they, they look this, they feel the same and fit in. And that's obviously causes some cultural identity issues later. And so um, just really want to encourage parents to, to, to really be open with their kids and be honest about their, their background. It's a big part of them. Yeah. And I think going off that too is, especially nowadays, like I think it's super important for parents to start educating their kids about their own story from the earliest possible time they can, because I think it, does a lot more for the own their own like the adoptee's own identity when they know their whole story from the get-go versus just finding out later down the road. And then especially now to um, really recognizing, especially if it's a transracial adoption, that their children many times are a person of color and knowing and educating them, themselves and so that they can also help their kids with the education on racism that happened in this country. And we all know that that's been super heightened this past year, especially towards Asian American communities. And I think like for us, like growing up, like we knew a lot about our culture, but even us, we didn't really talk about race a lot growing up. And I think part of that is just when we grew up, but I think that now that is such so prevalent and racism is so prevalent that it's that much more important that parents get that education and then also educate their children about it. Um, because whether the parents want to recognize it or not, their kids down the line are going to feel the impacts of our systemic oppression. I know I said it was the last question, but I still have mm -hmm. a last question. <laughs> it's just... <laughs> People like me want to be ally or we're outside the community, but we want to understand more about this whole um, cultural identity or adoptee issues. What would you say to us? I would say probably it's important to just be open about like your own curiosities and your intentions. Um, and ask some of the, like ask the questions and ask some of the questions that may be uncomfortable. Um, but I also think it's important too that if you really want to understand like the perspectives and maybe some of the resources too, like getting involved with some of these other resources on a volunteer basis is really great. Like uh, so many of them um, have opportunities to get involved, whether that's like at heritage camps, whether that's being a counselor or a presenter or even like a coordinator, because sometimes like the best coordinators really come from those who know the culture. Um, so I would say, you know, just getting involved, asking questions and then um, coming in with your intention straight forward. Yeah, I mean, I think that's spot on. Um, there's definitely some adoptees who aren't as eager to share their stories. And so um I don't know necessarily think that like asking everybody about their background is, is the right approach because some people are very like angry and have very <laughs> angry feelings about it and don't want to talk about it um but I mean I think yeah like Emily said volunteering for some of these groups and um is a good way to connect with that community for sure 
And that's a way that's more safe too, that you know that they may be more open to talking about it um, Mm -hmm. versus going up to a random stranger. Yep. Absolutely. Thank you so much for sharing. How can people find you? Yeah, you can find me on Instagram. Very active there. um, At S-Q-U-I-N-N-S-T-E-R. And also on Facebook for Sarah Quinn. Um, I am also on Instagram and Facebook. I am not nearly as active on them. (laughs) Fair warning to anyone who (laughs) wants to follow me. It will not be the most exciting thing of your life. But um, you can find me on Instagram at E-Q-U-I-N-N-O-X 94. Um, And then on Facebook, um, Emily Quinn. Um, Sometimes I'm hard to find unless you have a mutual friend. (laughs) So um, fair warning again. But that's where you can find me. Um, Yeah. Cool. I will definitely put the links and a handle in the episode now so the listeners can find you guys easily. Thank you so much for coming to the show. Thank you so much for for having having us. us. This was great. Thanks for listening to Chai with Ping. If you think someone will benefit from this episode, don't forget to share it with them. You can also follow us on Facebook and Instagram. If you like my show, you can buy me some chai with small donations. Details are in the episode notes. Till next time. Mm